Thank you for joining us today as we explain the ballot measures for the November 5th, 2024 ballot. I'm Elaine Manley. I'm the co-president of the League of Women Voters for Cupertino and Sunnyvale. And joining me in this presentation today are Tracy Edwards, my fellow co-president, and Pam Anderson, our voter services chair. Before we get into the ballot measures themselves, um, we'd like to give just a little bit of background about the League and a little bit of voting information as well. So the League has been empowering voters and defending democracy for over 100 years. We were founded in February 1920, about six months before women had the right to vote. And we have been educating voters ever since. We're now a membership that is open to everyone age 16 and above. We are nonpartisan, so we never support or oppose a candidate or a political party. We do have two distinct corporations, and they're done separately. One does voter education, such as today's event. The other is activities where we study the issues and we decide to take a position, and then as appropriate, we advocate for or against the passage of laws. Now, the only time we mention the League in during a ProCon meeting like today is if the League has formally signed on the ballot measure itself. So let's talk a little bit about the forums we've been doing. We have done quite a few forums already, and I'd like to direct your attention to our website, LWV, C for Cupertino, S for Sunnyvale. So that's lwvcs.org slash election dash forums. It has the list of our forums that we've completed as well as the ones that are upcoming. And it has the recording of every forum. So it's a great resource and do please share it widely. We'd love to get it to everybody in the state. <laughs> All right, next slide, please. So talk a little bit about voting. As you probably are aware, California passed the Voters' Choice Act. So everyone in California is vote by mail. And you have several options of how to vote and how to deliver your ballot. For example, you can complete your ballot at home and sign and date the ballot and pop it in the mail. Just be sure to mail it before November 5th. Yes, you're allowed to wait that long, but please don't. You know the deadline, please do it early. <laughs> so there's no, no question that your ballot arrives on time. There's also a ballot drop boxes you'll see around the local area. And these are official ballot drop boxes. Uh, you put your ballot into there and they are picked up um, every day and brought to the registrar of voters. The, the league is actually one of the groups that's doing that. So we promise you the drop boxes are safe and secure in our area. The third way is the vote center. And this replaces the uh, community polling stations we used to have. And you can go there to vote. You can drop off your ballot. You can get a ballot in a different uh, language. It's, it's an all services center so that you don't have to go to the registrar of voters. We do want to point out the registrar, ROV, registrar of voters, services.sccgov.org is another excellent website that has a lot of voter information. You can even go in there and tell them to track your ballot. So definitely want to check that one out. And one last thing, remember when you sign the back of your ballot, pay attention to the envelope that you receive your ballot in. Did it have your first, middle, and last name? or first and last name, and you just wanna sign it consistently or sign it like your driver's license and be sure to date it. All right, so next slide. Turnout, we do wanna take a moment to point out the importance of voting. And this was a study that's been done on the number of voters by age. And so the bottom pink line, for example, are voters age 18 to 29. And you can see they're about half the level of the gold line at the top, which are voters age 60 and above. And so it'd be nice if everybody was voting as high as possible, get to 80 to 100%. So no matter what your age, if you're over the age of 18, please vote and please encourage everyone that's eligible to vote as well. All right, so what are propositions and ballot measures? Just a couple of points on this. So when a new law is proposed, it's called a proposition or ballot measure. They're used interchangeably. And our state ballot measures or propositions um, usually require 50% or more yes vote in order to pass. There are some of the measures that require two thirds, especially like property taxes, uh, those require two thirds to pass. 
state propositions get onto the ballot two different ways. One is through our state legislature, and they can put something on the ballot. Usually uh, it's 50%, but if they're trying to change the constitution or a new tax or bond, then it's two thirds of the legislature to agree. The citizens can also put things on the ballot and they do that through an initiative process where they collect enough signatures to put something on the ballot. So you'll see today's presentation, we have 10 statewide ballot measures. Five of them are from the legislature and five of them are from the citizens or the initiatives. We do also have local measures and those can be put on by the city council or school boards or special districts. Um, and there, we're going to cover four local measures as well this evening. Very important as you go through analyzing these ballot measures is kind of how do you evaluate them? And we would like to suggest a few things that you ask yourself as you're walking through these different measures. The first one is, do you agree with the goals of that measure? Do you feel like it's good government or is it written in a way that it's most likely going to end up in court? The second is, how is it going to be funded? Does it have a source of revenue or is it going into the general fund? And, you know, then the state has to figure out how are they going to adjust the budget to be able to pay for this new measure? Another question to ask is, does it deal with one issue? Is it a simple, easy yes or no vote? Or is it really complex and maybe it should go through the legislative process where it gets more vetting? to be on the ballot in a future time. Another one is, should it be a constitutional amendment or should it just be a statute? And, and lastly, do be careful of advertisements. Unfortunately, I think we all know that there are um, sometimes sponsors or opponents that will say things that may or may not be factual. And so you wanna pay attention to who is putting it on the ballot, what's the money that's being spent on the ballot for or against it, and today we're going to show you some of that information. I think you'll be able to, uh, it'll help you understand that ballot measure more thoroughly. So what are pros and cons? Well, the League of Women Voters produces an analysis of the propositions of the ballots and they're unbiased, they're nonpartisan, and they're really meant to explain the measure in clear, easy to understand language. And so for each proposition we're gonna go through today, we're gonna to go over the issues, we're gonna go over the context of that proposition, and we're gonna review the arguments for and against each measure. And our goal really is to help you be much more informed so that you can make the best decision. And we're going to give you additional sources of information. So for example, on the next slide, um, I'd encourage you to take a screenshot or photo of this because it's got a lot of great nonpartisan election information. Our website, as I mentioned, lwvcs.org has a lot of voter information. Vote411.org is a nationwide uh, website that is all fact-checked and the league works on that website as well. So if you have friends outside of California, do let them know about vote411.org. And then you'll see Voter's Guide, Ballotpedia and others. So, you know, if you're not sure on a on ballot measure after listening to us and all the reading that you've already done, here are some additional resources for you. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what's on the ballot. So these first five propositions are the ones that were put on by the legislature. And in this case, they all just need a simple majority to pass. We're going to go over each of these in more detail, but just wanted you to see an overview of what we're going to talk about. The next slide shows the ballot measures that were put on by the initiative process where the citizens, we gathered enough signatures and they're now uh, put on the ballot. Same with this, it's gonna be a simple majority to pass these. And then lastly, we have the opportunity today to go over four local measures, uh, measure E, F, Y, and Z. So we will do that at the end of our presentation. So. All right, let's see here. So what we're going to do is we're going to present the proposition. We're going to open it up for a question or two, and then we'll go to the next proposition. If you could type your question in the Q&A, we will do our best to answer it. And if we run out of time, we'll try to reach out to you. If you want to send us an email, uh, we will try to answer your question that way. So let me turn it over to Tracy Edwards to go over proposition two. Thank you, Elaine, um, and welcome everybody. I'm gonna, as Elaine said, start with Proposition 2, which is a proposition put on the ballot by the state legislature and requires a simple majority to pass. 
The question before voters is, shall the state authorize $10 billion in general obligation bonds for repair, upgrade, construction for facilities at K-12 schools, for charter schools, community colleges, and career technical education programs? The state and local districts uh, tip state and local districts typically split the cost of education facilities. The state generally uses bonds like this one to pay its share of the cost and public school and community college districts usually pay their share by placing local bond measures on the ballot. In 2016, voters passed Prop 51. That was the last successful statewide uh, school bond measure. The money raised from Prop 51, $9 billion, has now been spent or fully allocated. So what does Prop 2 do? If approved, Prop 2 would provide $8.5 billion to public schools and $1.5 billion to community colleges to renovate schools or construct new facilities. Some of the public school funding would also be set aside to reduce lead in school water and building and or updating career technical education facilities and creating transitional kindergarten classrooms. Now this latter item, transitional kindergarten classrooms, is a move intended to alleviate $550 million transitional kindergarten facilities grant that was removed from the most recent California budget. Bond funds would be distributed to schools through grants on a first come first serve basis. To receive funding, schools and community college districts must raise their own funds. The state will then cover up to 65% of the cost for renovations and 55% for the cost of new construction. The formulas aim to provide a higher match to districts with lower assessed property values and a higher share of low income students and English learners. So the estimated cost to repay both the principal and interest for this bond would be about $500 million a year over 35 years. Payments would be made from the general fund. The general fund is the account the state uses to pay for most public services, including education, healthcare, and prisons. This would be about one half of 1% of the state's total general fund budget. The effect on local costs statewide is not clear. Local costs could increase if public school and community college districts decide to sell bond, bonds to fund their share of construction. Other districts could end up bar borrowing less because they use state funds provided by this bond. This slide shows you the top supporters and opponents for Prop 2. And not surprisingly, the top supporters include several large associations and unions affiliated with schools. Opponents include one assembly person and the Howard Jarvis Taxpayer Association. These statements are from the supporters and opponents of the proposition. These are arguments made by advocacy groups. They may or may not be accurate or true. And this is true for each of the propositions we're reviewing today. And we're not going to further repeat this statement. Now, arguments put forth by the supporters of this bond measure include that many school facilities are outdated and need basic health and safety repairs and upgrades, that all the money previously raised through Prop 51, the $9 billion, has been spent or allocated. And Prop 2 expands the eligibility for hardship grants for, and provides increased percentage of state matching funds to those schools demonstrating the greatest need. Arguments put forward by the opponents include that Prop 2 will increase our bond obligations by $10 billion, which will cost the taxpayers an estimated $18 billion when repaid with interest. And the Prop 2 will increase debt and could result in higher property taxes and loss of Prop 2 ignores declining enrollment in schools and community colleges. On this side, you'll see that the largest donors include the following, the California Building Industry Association for 1.725 million, the Coalition for Adequate School Housing for 1.5 million, and the California Teachers Association for 1.5 million. 
To date, no donations have been made in opposition to Prop 2. So what does your vote mean? A yes vote on this measure means that the state could borrow $10 million to build new or to renovate existing public school and community college facilities. A no vote on this measure means that the state could not borrow 10 billion to build new or renovate existing public school or community college facilities. And there's a question in chat that says, what about lottery money? How much goes to schools? You know, I don't know the answer and I don't know if any of my colleagues know the percentage of the lottery funds that go to schools, but we can try to find that out as uh, we proceed here. The quick lookup says that it was about $1.8 billion, roughly 1% of the state's annual budget for public schools. Thank you. So there are no more questions. I'm gonna go on to Proposition 3. So Proposition 3 is a legislative constitutional amendment. It received a 67 to zero vote with 13 absent in the state assembly and a 31 to zero vote with nine absent in the state Senate. Prop three requires a simple majority to pass. The question before voters is, should California's constitution be amended by replacing text that defines marriage between a man and a woman with the right to marry is a fundamental right? which would make the language consistent with current federal law. Federal courts have said that same-sex couples can marry, but outdated and illegal language in the California constitution still says that marriage can be between only a man and a woman. If we could go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, the legislature placed, oh, go up one, please. Thank you. The legislature placed this measure on the ballot to bring California constitutions in line with existing federal law that gives same-sex couples the right to marry as set forth in the 2015 U.S. Supreme Court decision. Now, while same-sex marriage is the law of the land, this change matters in the event federal law changes. There is no change to revenue or costs for the state or local governments since Prop 3 would not change who is currently allowed to marry in California. This slide shows you the top supporters and opponents of Prop 3. These are the people that signed the original pro and rebuttal statements that were submitted. Among the supporters include Equality California, Planned Parenthood, and the ACLU. Opponents include California Family Council and the American Council of Evangelicals. So among the arguments put forward by the supporters include that Prop 3 removes discriminatory language from our state constitution. It protects every California's right to marry, regardless of race or gender, and it updates our state's constitution to align with existing law. Arguments put forward by the opponents say that Prop 3 is fixing a problem that does not exist and is instead causing harm. Same-sex marriage has been legal since 2015 and no one is trying to change that, not the Supreme Court nor anyone else. And Prop 3 removes all rules for marriage, opens the door to child marriage, incest, and polygamy. The top donor for Prop 3 is the Federated Indians of Grayton, Rancheria with a donation of $1 million. Other large donors are listed on this slide with a total donations in support of Prop 3 of 2.6 million. There were no donations in opposition. So your vote. Yes means replace defining marriage as between a man and a woman with the right to marry as a fundamental right in the California constitution. There would be no current change in who can't marry. A no vote means you oppose removing marriage defined as a union between one man and one woman from the California Constitution. Again, there would be no change in who could currently marry. But if the U.S. Supreme Court in the future reverses its 2015 decision, which allows same-sex marriage nationally, the California Constitution, which prohibits same-sex marriage, would become active law again in California. 
and we have no open questions. All right, then I'll take over for Proposition 4. Now, it authorizes bonds for safe drinking water, and wildfire prevention and protection, protecting communities and natural lands from climate risks. Simple majority needed to pass. And so the question you're being asked is, should the state of California issue $10 billion in bonds to fund state and local parks, environmental protection projects, water infrastructure projects, energy projects, and flood protection projects. So this is a $10 billion general obligation bond measure. And notice that over the last 30 years, about $10 billion in state bonds were approved for parks and other environmental services. This bond was approved by the state legislature and they are asking for voter approval. So over the last 10 years, the state has been spending about $13 billion a year on resources and climate events and activities. And as you're aware, we've had more wildfires and droughts and other disasters that are very costly. And our water and energy infrastructure also needs significant upgrades. So for these and additional reasons, the legislature is asking the voters to approve the $10 billion bond. So what will it do? It was... It has a lot of specific projects, I guess is what I wanted to say. And, and here are a few that are listed. We've got about $4 billion on water related items, $2 billion on fire prevention and heat mitigation, $2 billion to protect land, parks and wildfire. And the proceeds from the bonds will be divided among these specific projects and agencies. And at least 40% of the bond proceeds must be used for activities that directly benefit communities that have lower incomes or are more vulnerable, vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. So what will it cost? Well, the California Legislative Analyst Office estimates that the increased cost to the state to repay the bonds under Prop 4 would be about $400 million a year for 40 years and that would be payable from general tax revenues. The state is currently repaying about 80 billion of bonds. And in addition, voters in the legislature have already approved 35 billion of bonds that have not yet been sold. So most of these bonds have been expected to be sold over the next several years. And the state is currently paying about 6 billion each year from the general fund to repay the bonds. So who are the supporters? Well, you can see from the slide that some of the top supporters are Clean Water Action, Cal Fire Firefighters, National Wildlife Federation, and more. And the opponents, top opponents are Senate Minority Leader Jones, Assembly Member Patterson, and the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. Are there any questions? Oh, sorry, we have, sorry, I have more to do. I just got the idea that somebody had questions. Let me try that again. We'll continue and then I'll ask you about the questions. So what some of the supporters are saying is we need to be helping communities adapt to climate change right now and reducing our climate pollution. Also, they're saying Prop 4 makes urgent common sense investments to protect our communities, health, economy, and natural resources by cleaning up and protecting water supplies, preventing devastating wildfires, and protecting forests, beaches, freshwater sources, and wildlife habitats. Some of the things the opponents are saying is bonds are the most expensive way to, for the government to pay for things. And Prop 4 would add $10 billion of debt to the taxpayers, plus an estimated $9.3 billion in interest. So some of the top donors supporting this measure of about $5 million are nature-related organizations. And we're not aware of any funds raised to oppose this measure. So what would a yes vote mean? The state could borrow the $10 billion to fund the various activities. A no vote means the state could not borrow the $10 billion for these activities. And now I can ask, do you have any questions? We do not? All right, then I'll go on to Proposition 5. So Proposition 5 allows local bonds for affordable housing and public infrastructure with a 55% voter approval and it does just need a simple majority to pass. So the question you were being asked is, should the voter threshold for local bond measures for affordable and public infrastructure be lowered from the current two thirds down to 55%? 
So a little bit of background. Because of Prop 13, most local bonds and related property taxes require two thirds voter approval. Local bonds for schools require 55% voter approval with a law that was passed in November of 2000. So Prop 13 says property taxes to pay for bonds are limited to 1% of the property's assessed value, except for school bonds. And Prop 39 is the, the bill that was passed in November of 2000 that lowered that approval rating to 55%. Also wanted to point out that California currently has 350 billion in the outstanding debt, 80 billion is in state debt, as I mentioned earlier, and 270 billion is, in, is the debt between cities, counties, schools, universities, and other agencies. So what will this measure do? Number one, as it said, it will lower the approval threshold from 60, 62 thirds percent down to 55% for local bonds for affordable housing and public infrastructure. So I thought it'd be important to talk a little bit about how are they defining affordable housing? So it's housing developments, it's, um, Developments that are affordable to individuals, families, seniors, people with disabilities, or first time home buyers who are in the lower income bracket. It also includes down payment assistance programs and first time home buyer programs and permanent supportive housing facilities that are used to serve residents in affordable housing. It also explains that at risk of chronic homelessness includes but is not limited to persons who are high risk of long-term or intermittent homelessness, including persons with mental illness, exiting institutional settings, including but not limited to jail and mental health facilities. And permanent supportive housing means housing with no limit on length of stay. Some examples of infrastructure projects by local governments includes roads and bridges, libraries, hospitals, water treatment, and more. So this bond would require specific accountability measures for these bonds. It has a citizens oversight committee and annual independent financial and performance audits. And if it does pass, it enables affordable housing and infrastructure type bonds on the ballot that are on this ballot now to be approved at the 55% level, approval level. One more important point to note is the San Francisco Chronicle said that proponents of Prop 5 and the realtors created a carve out in July, the legislator amended the measure at the behest of the California Association of Realtors to ban local governments from using Prop 5 money to purchase or demolish existing single family homes and homes up to the size of fourplexes to replace them with denser affordable housing. In exchange, the realtors agreed to not fight Prop 5, even though they had raised more than $20 million in opposition. So this is significant because about 96% of residential land is zoned single family homes, according to the UC Berkeley study. So what will it cost? Well, there's no direct cost associated with Prop 5 because it's not a tax and it's not a bond. But Prop 5 changes the number of votes required to approve these types of bonds. So if it passes, it does increase the likelihood that bond measures will be approved which would lead to increase in property taxes in the communities that do approve the new bonds. So let's look at some of the supporters and opponents. Some of the top supporters include the California Professional Firefighters Association, uh, the League of California Cities, and others. Some of the opponents are taxpayer organizations, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, Women's Veterans Alliance, and more. So what are the supporters saying? Well, a few things that they're saying is it gives local communities more tools to make housing more affordable. And it trusts that local voters can prioritize infrastructure projects that are most important to their communities. And the two thirds threshold is prohibitively high for many local governments to meet. That was according to the San Francisco Chronicle. Some of the things the opponents are saying is it defines infrastructure so broadly that it can include just about anything and it allows retroactive approval, like the local bonds on the November 2024 ballot will pass with a 55% approval. And if the purpose is to make it easier for bonds to pass affordable housing, why place such significant constraint on where that housing can be built, according to the San Francisco Chronicle. So let's look at the money behind the measure. 
you can see about $6.5 million has been raised. Um, 3.3 from NPH Action Fund and 2.5 from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. And then for the opponents, you see about $30 million has been raised opposing this. Many of it has been donated by the real estate organizations. All right, so what does a yes vote mean? It means the voter approval threshold for local housing and infrastructure bonds will drop from 66 and two thirds to 55%. And a no vote means that that threshold will remain at the two thirds level. Are there any questions? There are none. There are none. All right, let's go on to Proposition 6. So Prop 6 eliminates the constitutional provision allowing involuntary servitude for incarcerated persons. Prop 6 was passed unanimously in the Assembly and overwhelmingly at 33 to 3 vote in the Senate. A simple majority is needed to pass. So the question you're being asked is, should we remove the current constitutional provision that allows jails and prisons to impose involuntary servitude to punish crime? For example, forcing incarcerated persons to work. So a little bit about the, the current situation. California constitution currently bans involuntary servitude except as punishment for crime. And people in prison and jail can be required to work and they can be punished for refusing to work. And that pay can be for less than a dollar an hour. The Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation does offer time credits for good conduct and work to reduce the time served. And according to Cal Matters, it, uh, currently able-bodied prisoners are required to either work or participate in rehabilitative programming or a combination of the two. So what will this do? Well, it changes the constitution to ban that involuntary servitude, and it does ban prisons, state prisons, from disciplining people who refuse to work. And it allows the direction, sorry, it allows the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation to award credits to an incarcerated person who voluntarily accepts a work assignment. So what will it cost? Well, they're not really sure, um, the prisoners could have increased, sorry, the prisons could have increased wages for labor, and that would mean cost would increase. But if time credits are used, then that means their sentences would be shorter, and that would cause the prison costs to drop. The other question that isn't certain yet is, are incarcerated persons supposed to be paid at minimum wage? Because right now, as we mentioned, they're paid, they're not paid a minimum wage. So that could affect the cost as well. And that I believe is currently in court. So as far as the supporters, the top supporters include um, Assembly Member Wilson, the Dolores Huerta Foundation, ACLU and others. And there are no opponents on uh, the ballot. As far as what do the supporters say? Well, it ends forced labor, which constitutes slavery. It enhances public safety by prioritizing rehabilitation and punishments can undermine rehabilitation and increase the likelihood of reoffending. There were no statements on the ballot, um, but there have been several statements in opposition that we felt were relative and important to show an opponent's side. So on the next slide, please. It shows uh, from the Mercury News, California's prisoners should not be subjected to abuse, abuse by their jailers, but inmates should not be legally empowered to dictate what chores they're willing to do behind bars. That's why voters should reject Prop 6, a measure cloaked in language about slavery and involuntary servitude that's really about prisoners being able to turn down work assignments. And then KQED Voter Guide said, Vote no on Prop 6. If incarcerated people turn down work assignments, prisons would have to spend more money to hire people to cook or clean. Inmates are supposed to be paying their debt to society while incarcerated, and taxpayers should not have to assume a greater burden to fund prison chores. So the money behind the measure, some of the donors in support are All of Us or None Action Network and some individuals. There are no donors uh, recorded as far as contributing, opposing the measure. 
So a yes vote means people in prison or jail cannot be forced to work and prisons and jails cannot discipline people for refusing to work. And a no vote means prisons and jails can continue to force people to work and punish those who refuse to work. Are there any questions? There are none. All right. We will go on to the next slide. Thank you. And th this is really a reminder slide that Elaine covered at the very beginning. And as mentioned earlier, state propositions can be put on the ballot two ways, through the legislature or via citizens if they collect enough signatures, the latter known as the initiative process. We're now starting our review of the initiative propositions on the November ballot. And we wanted to highlight some of the points previously mentioned. We wanna repeat a few comments because the initiative propositions are often more complex than the legislative propositions and often have more problems meeting the evaluation criteria on this slide. So as we go through the next five propositions, keep in mind just a few things. Does the, men, does the measure mandate a government program or service without addressing how it's going to be funded? Does the measure deal with one issue that can be easily decided with a yes or no vote, or is it a complex issue that should, go through, that should be more thoroughly examined through the legislative arena? And last, assess who are the real sponsors and opponents of the measure. What are their affiliations? And who is funding the supporters or the opponents? And with that, I'm handing it over to Pam. Okay, thank you, Tracy. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Pam, Pam Anderson. Mike, you want to come on screen for us? Oh. Okay. Hi again, this is Pam Anderson, and I am the Voter Service Chair for the League of Women Voters Cupertino Sunnyvale. Uh, I'm going to start by talking about Proposition 32, which uh, wants to raise minimum wage. This is an initiative statute, so it was put on the ballot by the people, and it requires a simple majority to pass. Prop 32 asks, should California increase minimum wage to reach $18 an hour in 2020, 2025 for large employers, which they defined as 26 or more employees, and in 2026 for smaller employers with 25 or fewer employees with subsequent annual adjustments for inflation. So first some background information, uh, the minimum wage in California is currently $16 an hour and the national minimum wage is $7.25. National minimum wage has not changed in 12 years. And according to the uh, bill text, if it had increased at the rate of productivity growth, it would be uh, $24 per hour right now. It's worth noting that 34 states do have a higher minimum wage than the $7.25 national level. In California, minimum wage is also higher for certain industries like fast food and in certain cities. For example, many cities in Santa Clara County have approved minimum wages that are above $16 an hour. Mountain View and Sunnyvale have minimum wage above $18 an hour. San Jose, Santa Clara, Cupertino, Los Altos, and Palo Alto are all above $17.50. The cost of living in California is high. The average uh, living wage for a single adult with no children is $27.32, and that's per the MIT Living Wage Calculator. In 2022, 35.2% of California workers earn less than $19.69 an hour, and the majority of low-wage workers in California are either young, under age 25, or over age 50. It's also worth noting that minimum wage laws do not apply to independent contractors and other self-employed people. So what will Prop 32 do? Prop 32 will um, increase minimum wage from the current $16 an hour to $18 an hour, uh, to $18 an hour. For businesses with more than 25 employees, it would increase to 17 for the remainder of 2024 and then $18 an hour from January, 2025 onward. 
Businesses that are smaller with 25 or fewer employees get an extra year, so the rage would increase to $17 in 2025, $18 in 2026. And then from that point onward, there would be an annual uh, adjustment for inflation using the uh, national inflation adjustment. Um, and this would be capped at three and a half percent per year. It's worth noting that an increase in own wages from $16 to $18 an hour would be an annual increase of about $6,000 for someone who's working 40 hours per week at a minimum wage job. What will it cost to raise minimum wage? In short, um, the employers will have to pay higher wages, um, but some of the other economic effects are unclear. The number of jobs in the state could go up or down because uh, with the thought being that if employers have to pay more, they might employ fewer people. Government costs could increase or decrease. And this uh, impact would likely be small. Um, the increase would be for an increase in salaries and the decrease would be a decrease in costs for health and human service programs. So if people are uh, earning more money, they may not require as many uh, services. Finally, government revenue would likely decrease from lower corporate taxes, but there would be some offsetting increases in payroll and sales tax. Looking at the supporters and opponents of this of Prop 32, one of the uh, you'll see that one of the uh, supporters is Joe Sandberg, and he has been the prim primary financial supporter and we'll show that in a few slides. Opponents of this measure are generally, generally reflect the industries that would be paying higher wages if Prop 32 passes. Looking at what proponents, supporters and opponents say, they call out that about 2 million, supporters say that 2 million Californians work full-time but earn less than $18 an hour. Prop 32 will help service workers, essential workers, single moms, and other working Californians afford life's basic needs. And they say that higher wages benefit everyone because people have more money to spend. Finally, they point out that when employers do not pay workers a living wage, it's taxpayers who make up the difference through social programs. Corporations should be paying their employees, not taxpayers. The opponents say that the market is what should determine employees' wages. Prop 32 will hurt the people that it's trying to help because of increased wages will cost increased prices and result in job loss. They say that increasing minimum wage will hurt small businesses, and they highlight that this proposition is the effort of just one person. Looking at the money behind Prop 32, you can see that um, current for the current proposition, $200,000 has been raised, but it is worth noting that in 2022, uh, Joe Sandberg spent about $10.8 million to have uh, the minimum wage increase put on the ballot. There were some issues with the signature process, uh, so it was deferred to the 2024 ballot. Finally, um, as I mentioned, the money in opposition, there's about $110,000, and that has come primarily from industries that would have to pay a higher wage. Looking at... Uh, so just in closing, what uh, would this mean? If Prop 32 passes, California minimum wage would increase to $18 an hour in 2026. After that, it would go up each year based on inflation. And a no vote means that California minimum wage would be closer to about $17 per hour in 2026. And after that, it would still go up each year based on inflation. Any questions? No questions. Next, we've got Prop 33. Prop 33 is about expanding local government's authority to enact rent control on residential properties. It's an initiative statute, and it uh, requires a simple majority to pass. Before I go into further discussion of um, Prop 33, I do want to highlight that Prop 33 and Prop 34 should be looked at um, together. 
Uh, when you look at the supporters and opponents of these two measures, you'll see that uh, the parties who oppose one measure are the parties who oppose the other measure. And it's just something that you should be aware of as we consider these two propositions. Going back to Prop 33, Prop 33 asks, shall the Costa Hawkins Rental Housing Act of 1995 be repealed and cities and counties be allowed to control rent for any housing without limitation from the state? It is an initiative st uh, statute and requires a simple majority to pass. Prop 33 asks, um, Prop 33 is about rent control. And rent control laws are restrictions that are placed on the amount of rent and increases in rent that landlords can charge. About one quarter of Californians live in cities with local rent control, and this includes Los Angeles, San Francisco, and San Jose. In 1995, the state legislator passed the Costa Hawkins Housing Act, which puts three statewide limits on rent control. Rent control cannot apply to any single family home. Rent control cannot apply to any housing built on or after February 1st, 1995. And rent control laws cannot tell landlords what they can charge a new renter when first moving in. Rent control can only limit how much landlords increase rent for existing renters. In 2019, the state legislature also passed the Tenant Protection Act, which is a law that prevents landlords from increasing rent by more than 5% plus inflation up to a total of 10% a year. This law expires in 2030, and it also does not apply to most single family units or units built within the last 15 years. It's also worth noting that similar ba ballot measures regarding rent control were put on the ballot and defeated in both 2018 and 2020. So what will Prop 33 do? Prop 33 will move rent control from st uh, state government to local governments. It will allow local governments to, um, so it'll eliminate the cost of Hawkins law, which will, and it will allow local governments, cities and counties to control rents for any housing. They can limit how much, a, they can also increase how much a landlord may increase rents when a new renter moves in. Prop 33 also prevents the state from taking any further action to limit rent control. So again, it'll put rent control into the authority of more local governments rather than the state government. So what will it cost? Understanding the cost of rent control um, has both short-term and long-term impacts. In the short term, uh, the rents that renters who live in properties covered by rent control spend le get to spend less on rents. However, for renters who live in properties not covered by rent control, it is possible that they will end up spending more on rent. In the longer term, rent control also impacts the availability of rental as the potential to impact the availability of rental properties. If landlords can charge less for rent, um, developers are less likely to develop rental properties. And um, so in the if fewer properties are developed, then over time, the uh, supply gets is reduced and therefore rents have the potential to increase. Properties become harder to find. Another possible impact of, um, of rent control is that if the, um, if the property values decline because the return that you get on your rent decreases, then the property taxes would also decrease. And another cost to local governments would be increases in costs 
to implement and enforce any new rent control laws that are passed. Finally, it's important to note that the exact implications of the law would depend on any new laws that are passed by local governments, and these would likely vary from city to city. Let's look at the supporters and opponents of rent control. The supporters include uh, groups such as Veterans Voices, California Alliance for Retired Americans, um, and the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. Opponents include the California Small Business Association, California Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and the California Senior Alliance, and a UC Berkeley economics professor. Again, these are the folks who signed the ballot statement. We'll look at, uh, and we'll be looking further to see who funded this proposition. Looking at what supporters and opponents say, the supporters say the California housing crisis is complex and that the cost of living is too high. 55% of Californians are rent burdened, paying more than 30 to 50% of their income on rent. Rent control is working well in cities in, uh, elsewhere in the country. And Prop 33 will return decisions about rent control back to local governments so that they can pass policies that work for their residents. Opponents say that Prop 33 is misleading and it overturns more than 100 state housing laws. It will make it easier to build, a, uh, and the laws that will be overturned are laws that make it easier to build affordable housing and laws that provide fair housing and tenant protections. They also say that Prop 33 would eliminate the state's ability to enforce housing laws. They remind voters, or they remind us that voters rejected these proposals in 2018 and 2020. And they highlight that Prop 33 is primarily funded by the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. It's a good segue into the campaign finance for Prop 33, which shows that of the $41.6 million raised in support of Prop 33, 41.3 million of it is from the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. The, um, in terms of the money raised to oppose Prop 33, over $87 million has been raised and most of that comes from um, organizations like the California Apartment Association, California Association of Realtors, National Association of Realtors. So in summary, what does a yes vote and a no vote mean? A yes vote means that the current rent control laws from Costa Hawkins would be repealed and cities and counties would be allowed to implement rent control for any housing without limitation from the state. The Costa Hawkins law, a no vote means that the Costa Hawkins laws would remain in effect. Cities and counties would not be allowed to implement rent control and the state, uh, the state level restrictions would stay in place. Any questions? No questions. Okay. So now we turn to Prop 34. Prop 34 asks, or is about restricting spending of, uh, from a prescription drug, uh, sorry, let me start over. Prop 34 is about restricting spending of prescription drug revenues by certain healthcare providers. It's an initiative statute and it requires a simple majority to pass. Prop 34 asks, should certain healthcare, healthcare entities have to follow new rules about how they spend revenue they earn from a federal drug discount program. Breaking these rules would result in penalties such as not being able to operate as a healthcare entity for a 10 year period. So looking at this question, you'll wanna know who are the certain healthcare entities, what are the new, and what are the new rules they would have to follow? And lastly, what is this federal drug discount program? So the federal drug discount program is called 340B, and it allows qualifying healthcare providers who serve low-income patients to purchase drugs from the pharmaceutical companies at a discounted price, and then to resell those drugs through the uh, through the patients through patients' healthcare providers. Uh, and they basically generate revenue through that process. 
and that uh, the money that they raise is intended to be used to serve low-income populations. It's also a part of this proposition. It's important to know that Medi-Cal RX is a drug program that benefits Medi-Cal patients who are uh, low-income Californians. And um, with Medi-Cal RX, the patients uh, are, they do not have that price gap from which to generate revenue. So what will Prop 34 do? Prop 34 will require specific entities to spend at least 98% of revenue from the federal 340B program on direct patient care and to submit detailed accounting reports annually to the state. There are four criteria to identify the entities to whom Prop 34 would apply. These four criteria are that the participant, that they must participate in the federal drug discount program. They must have a license in California to operate as a health care, as a health plan, pharmacy, or clinic. They have to have had a 10-year period where they have spent over a hundred million dollars for purposes other than direct patient care. And they have to have owned and operated multifamily housing units with at least 500 severe violations. There are very few entities and possibly only one, the AIDS Healthcare Foundation, who meet all four of these criteria. Prop 34 um, also requires that the Medi-Cal RX program be added to state law which again removes a funding source. And if um, the entities who to whom Prop 34 applies do, um, do uh, are non-compliant, then they could lose their tax exempt status and licensure for 10 years. What are the fiscal impacts of Prop 34? The first bullet highlights that it would be a limited statewide fiscal impact because few entities are affected. There are very few entities who meet all four of the criteria. Furthermore, it asks who would be responsible for the cost of Prop 34, and those would be charged to the entities themselves. There's possible savings to the state if entities spend more money on patient care, right? Because they're gonna to have to increase to that 98%. However, there's also possibly incre increased state costs if entities are no longer able to use the 340B program and are less able to spend on patient services, the state would have to pick up the slack. So who is in support of Prop 34? Um, there are various organizations, uh, the ALS Association, the Latino Heritage uh, LA Group, California Professional Firefighters, HEP Be Free, San Francisco HEP Be Free, and the California Senior Alliance. Opponents include the National Organization for Women, Consumer Watchdog, and the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. What do supporters and opponents say? Supporters say that Prop 34 will stop the worst abusers of the federal drug discount program and ensure that they are appropriately using taxpayer dollars. They say Prop 34 will require the, um, will prevent overcharging government agencies for prescription drugs. In contrast, the opponents say that Prop 34 has one and only one purpose, and that is to prevent the AIDS Healthcare Foundation, the largest HIV AIDS organization in the world, from supporting rent control. They highlight that 100% of the funds from the 340B program come from the drug companies, um, and that uh, the nonprofits who use the 340B program are permitted by federal law to use these drug company discounts in accordance with their nonprofit mission. It, it highlights that Prop 34, or they highlight that Prop 34 is seeking to weaponize the initiative process by allowing powerful interests to target and silence a single organization. Looking at the funding for Prop 34, over $30 million has been raised and 30 million of it comes from the California Apartment Association Issues Committee. In contrast, there's been 7 million raised, over 7 million raised in opposition, most of it coming from the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. Are there any questions about Prop 34? There are none. 
Okay, I will hand the presentation back to Tracy. Thank you. Oops, sorry, I skipped one. Uh, yes vote means that certain healthcare entities would have to comply with the new rules and a no vote means that these new rules would not go into effect. Thank you. Prop 35 is another initiative statute and requires a simple majority to pass. It aims to make permanent an existing tax on managed healthcare plans in order to provide ongoing funding for Medi-Cal and other healthcare services. The question before voters is, should voters make permanent an existing tax on, tax on managed healthcare insurers, which if approved by the federal government, provide revenues to pay for Medi-Cal healthcare services and create rules for how the state uses the revenues. Medi-Cal is the state's low income health insurance program that covers one in three Californians. At first glance, Prop 35 appears to be a straightforward measure. The title is simple and non-controversial. It provides permanent funding for Medi-Cal healthcare services. Furthermore, the state's official voter guide includes only an argument in favor of Prop 35. No argument was provided in opposition. And yet Prop 35 is a complex measure. Medi-Cal, as I said, was, is, I should say, Medi-Cal Medi is California's Medicaid program, providing healthcare coverage to approximately 15 million eligible low-income residents. The state currently imposes a tax on managed healthcare plans, referred to as MCOs, and that tax is set to expire in 2026. This tax generates revenue that when matched with federal funds, helps pay for healthcare services for Medi-Cal recipients. The more the state spends on Medi-Cal services, the larger the match from the federal government. Now this tax was originally passed as a temporary tax in 2009, but has been periodically extended and modified. Most recently, it was approved in 2023 and is set to expire again in 2026. The MCO tax is distinct from other types of state taxes in that its primary benefit to the state comes from the additional federal funds made available because of the tax. Further, the MCOs on whom the tax is imposed are indifferent to the tax because they can include the tax in their reimbursable costs. Next slide, please, thank you. Prop 35 would make the existing tax on MCO plans permanent starting in 2027, subject to ongoing federal approval. Now, while the federal government has historically approved California's MCO tax, the federal government has recently indicated that it may revise the rules governing the MCO taxes, which could have serious adverse consequences on Medi-Cal funding. Additionally, Prop 35 would require that revenues be used only for specified Medi-Cal services in ways different from the current distribution of funds. These services include primary and specialty care, emergency care, family planning, mental health, and prescription drugs. In contrast, services like community health workers, private duty nurses, continuous Medi-Cal coverage for eligible children up to the age of five would lose funding. And to change the prescribed services outlined in Prop 35 would require either a three quarters vote of both houses of the state legislature, which is an extremely high hurdle, or voter approval. Prop 35 further caps the administrative expenses for these program and requires independent audits of the program. And last, starting in, two, in 2027, Prop 35 would cost the state approximately one to $2 billion annually. Now through the, as I said, through the end of 2026, there's no change to, the, to state revenues regarding this tax. But then for the next four years, there'll be an increase in funding for Medi-Cal and other health programs of roughly two to five billion annually, which includes that federal matching fund. But there will also be an increase in total state cost of roughly one to $2 billion annually for which over that four year period would have to be paid for by the state's general fund. Now the long-term effects for state revenues and costs are not known. 
This slide shows you the top supporter, supporters for Prop 35. Proponents are, include the American Academy of Pediatrics, the International Association of EMTs, and Planned Parenthood. And there are no opponents listed on the ballot. We're gonna to get to that next slide. Thank you. So what do the supporters say? Well, they say that California's healthcare system is in crisis, that Prop 35 provides dedicated funding to improve healthcare systems for all of us without raising taxes. And the state can no longer divert any of the MCO tax. Further, it dictates funding for specific needs and not the changing choices of the legislature. It builds strong accountability, and Prop 35 is supported by first responders, healthcare workers, physicians, nurses, and a bipartisan coalition. Now, the opponents, there are no formal arguments offered in opposition to Prop 35, but the editorials in opposition to Prop 35 raise the following points. Prop 35 would require the state to spend MCO tax revenues on specified Medi-Cal services, thus establishing in perpetuity the funding of winners and losers. It blocks the state from using MCO tax revenues to replace existing Medi-Cal funding. This restriction inhibits the ability of lawmakers to adjust spending plans based on the state's financial outlook. Changing Prop 35's prescribed spending allocations would require either the three quarters vote of both houses of the state legislature and near impossibility for voter approval. And last, Prop 35 is a special interest driven proposition. It is ballot box budgeting that limits the discretion of lawmakers and reduces the flexibility to respond to fiscal crises. The top three donors in support of Prop 35 are the California Association of Hospitals and Health Systems for $15 million, Global Medical Response and its subsidiaries for $13 million and the California Association of Physicians for, for $10,451,000. Collectively, these three groups have contributed 38 million in support of Prop 35 and including other large donors shown on the slide, support, uh, excuse me, funds raised in support of Prop 35 total 49.5 million. There are no donors in opposition to Prop 35. So what does your vote mean? A yes vote on this measure means an existing tax on health plans that provides funding for certain health programs would become permanent and new rules would direct the state on how they must use the revenue. A no vote on this measure means an existing state tax on health plans would end in 2027 unless the legislature continues it and the new rules would not become law. And now we're looking at how does Obamacare plan fit into this? Uh, Ob Obamacare is who has the right to receive uh, or availability to receive health insurance. And that isn't going to change. That's part of what the Obamacare plan does. Uh, but that does not change for this. This is simply a funding measure for Medi-Cal um, recipients and has really no overlap with the Obamacare plan. I don't know if my colleagues would like to chime in on that. No, that's correct. Nothing. I'm gonna hand it to Elaine. Great, thank you. All right, so the next measure is Proposition 36 and it allows felony charges and it increases the sentences for certain drug and theft crimes. So the question that you're voting on is should California increase penalties for some theft and drug crimes and allow a new class of crime called treatment mandated felony and require courts to warn people that they could be charged with murder for drug crimes that kill someone? So just a few basics. Felonies, as you know, they're much more serious than misdemeanors and they receive greater punishment. Misdemeanor penalties tend to be county jail, community supervision or fines, while felonies have longer sentences and must be served in state prison or county jail. So in 2014, the voters approved Prop
Prop 47, which changed some theft and drug crimes from felonies to misdemeanors, and it reduced some penalties. So that proposition made some thefts like shoplifting misdemeanors if the property was worth less than $950, and it reduced most drug possession crimes to misdemeanors. And the directed funding to community programs because the proposition required that money saved by reducing the costs of the prisons, that money had to go to be spent on mental health, drug treatment, school truancy, and dropout prevention and crime victim services. And these savings amounted to about $95 million last year. Now in 2024, about 1 million people signed the petition to amend Prop 47 and recently, on August 16th of this year, Governor Newsom has signed a package of 10 bills intended to make it easier to prosecute property theft without undoing Prop 47, which reduces prison sentences for nonviolent crimes. Notably, these bills would make repeat theft convictions a felony. It could collect crimes across multiple counties so they can be charged as a felony. And a person can be prosecuted for organized retail theft if they commit a crime with one more person, so two or more people. Um, now, property crime statistics show that property crime rates in 2023, specifically shoplifting and commercial burglaries, soared after the COVID-19 pandemic higher than at any time since at least the year 2000, according to an analysis from the Public Policy Institute of California. And the authors noted that shoplifting tends to be underreported, so the actual numbers are likely higher. So what will this proposition do? Prop 36 would undo parts of Prop 47, and it would increase penalties for property crimes and some drug crimes. And so first, it's going to reclassify some theft and drug misdemeanors to felonies, and it'll increase the punishment. For example, thefts on property worth less than the 950 and possession of certain drugs, including fentanyl, could be charged as felonies if the perpetrator had two prior theft or drug convictions, and the sentences could be up to three years. At this time, both these crimes can only be charged as misdemeanors. Second, Prop 36 would create new treatment-mandated felony for some drug offenses, and this applies to people who possess certain drugs and have two or more prior drug convictions. They would have the option to participate in drug and mental health treatment. Defendants who plead guilty to felony drug possessions and complete this treatment can have charges dismissed. Those who do not could serve up to three years in state prison. And third, the proposition requires the courts to warn people convicted of selling or providing illegal drugs they can be charged with murder if they later sell or provide drugs that end up killing someone. So what will it cost? Well, the proposition could potentially increase state and local criminal justice costs from several tens of millions of dollars to the low hundreds of millions of dollars each year. And it's primarily because the state prison population would increase by a few thousand people or so, and the sentences would be longer. There's currently about 90,000 people in prison right now, and there's about 250,000 at the county level. These extra costs would be the result of increasing the court workload as well, because felonies usually take more time to resolve than misdemeanors. So on the next slide, it shows some of the top supporters. Uh, we have the California District Attorneys Association and Crime Victim United, among others. And some of the opponents are the DA of Contra Costa County and Prosecutors Alliance, California Dem Club, and the ACLU. Some of the things that supporters are saying is, you know, a balanced, if you go to the next slide, please. Thank you. A balanced approach that corrects loopholes in state law. It'll stop the smash and grab thefts, hold repeat criminals accountable, toughen penalties for fentanyl and drug trafficking, and encourage drug treatment for addicts. Opponents are saying this proposition does not provide real solutions for retail theft and fentanyl problems, and it reignites the failed war on drugs, making simple drug possession a felony. This measure would end up sending thousands of people into state prison. So some of the money behind the measure, the top supporters are really major retailers, Walmart, Home Depot, and more, totaling over $13 million. 
And some of the donors opposing this measure are the SEIU and some individuals to the tune of about $3.8 million. So what does a yes vote mean? It means people convicted of certain drug or theft crimes would receive increased punishment, such as longer prison sentences. And in certain cases, people who possess illegal drugs would be required to complete treatment or serve up to three years in prison. A no vote means the punishment for drug and theft crimes would remain the same. Are there any questions? Don't see any? All right, nope. so now I'm gonna turn it over to Pam and she's gonna go over some of the local ballot measures. Okay, thank you, Elaine. So there are four uh, local measures on the ballot. Two of them are specific to the city of Sunnyvale, one to the Sunnyvale Elementary School District or SESD, and one to the Cupertino Union School District, CUSD. Measure E is the first one and it is for the city of Sunnyvale. And it is um, about uh, issuing a bond for the Sunnyvale Public Library. As a municipal bond, it requires a two thirds majority to pass. However, if you remember back to Proposition 5, um, if Proposition 5 passes during this election, the uh, threshold to pass for prop for Measure E will be reduced to 55%. Measure E asks, Shall the city of Sunnyvale authorize $290 million in general obligation bonds to build a new main library? Sunnyvale's public uh, main library was built in 1960 when the population was about 53,000 people as opposed to 150,000 people today. People use the library for educational and for cultural programs. They use the library to learn to read, to prepare for jobs, study for school, access computers, and the internet. From July 2023 to July, June 2024, the fiscal year for Sunnyvale, over 380,000 people visited, or there were 380,000 visitors to the library. $1.7 million, $1.7 million materials borrowed, and 55,000 people, or 55, People, there were 55,000 attendees at library programs. Unfortunately, the size and configuration of the library limits programming and service, service options. The building needs frequent plumbing, roof, and other maintenance repairs, and the existing wiring limits the addition or changing of technology. In 2000, the city did propose a $108 million library bond. It received a 59% approval, but two thirds was required. And in September 2024, the city of Sunnyvale will be breaking ground on the Lakeshore, or has broke ground on the Lakeshore Branch Library, which is projected to open in late 2025 and is located in Lakewood Park in North Sunnyvale. So Measure E would raise $290 million to construct a new main library that meets modern building standards and expands areas for both the collection and for programs and events. It'll meet modern accessibility, structural, and earthquake building standards. It'll increase community areas and, and rooms to, uh, to provide more space for programming and events. It'll expand the space dedicated for children and teens. It'll update the wiring to accommodate new and modern technology and provide space to expand the library's overall collection, including multicultural and multilingual materials. The new library would be built in the space adjacent to the current library and across from the new city hall. What will the measure cost? It'll be a $290 million bond. It, property taxes would increase by a maximum of $27, $27.47 per $100,000 of a property's assessed value. So if you look at your property, uh, property owner looks at their tax bill, they'll see an assessed value, which is different and lower than the market value. The tax would apply to all residential and commercial properties, and the um, bond proceeds would not be spent on city employees' salaries or operating expenses. It would be for the construction of the library, and there would be account accountability measures in place, such, in, such as an independent citizens oversight committee and annual financial and performance audits. 
Supporters of Measure E include, um, there were several sub city council members listed here, but the uh, Measure E did receive unanimous support from the city council. And opponents include uh, two citizens, Svetlana Alba and Michael Goldman, a former Sunnyvale council member. Looking at the arguments in support and against, supporters say that the current library is too small to meet the needs of Sunnyvale's current population. The infrastructure is failing and it's expensive to maintain and repair. A new building will greatly increase the space for children and teens. It'll add study and meeting rooms, community rooms, and meet the highest seismic safety and green standards. They also highlight that Sunnyvale's strong credit rating means that we can borrow money at affordable rates. Opponents say that the bond will increase property taxes on all Sunnyvale properties for 25 years. And they highlight that when property tax increases, rent also increases. They say that the library will be the seventh largest in California and that the cost per square foot is too high, especially when compared to other recent projects. Um, tearing down the existing, they also highlight that tearing down the existing library, the existing building, instead of renovating and adding to the existing library is an environmentally destructive waste of money and material. I do want to highlight that the city of Sunnyvale has posted a Q&A um, that addresses uh, both some of the information of supporters and opponents, and I encourage folks to look, go to uh, the city website and look at, uh, if you look at uh, Sunnyvale, you know, Sunnyvale, City of Sunnyvale Measure E, uh, you'll get it, the Q&A and fact sheets from the city. So finally, what does a yes vote and a no vote mean? The yes vote means that the city would be authorized to borrow $290 million to build a new main library, and a no vote means that the city would not borrow the money to build the new main library. Any questions? There's one not really related to our forum, but uh, it's asking about whether Measure AA, what, what about Measure AA in Mountain View? That has to do with um, Mountain View Weissman School District. Weissman. Weissman, thank you. Don't Obviously I don't know it. Uh, it's a parcel tax. Um, that's on the ballot, and it's an unusual tax because it's variable based on the size of the building on the land. Uh, so that would be a tax for schools. It has nothing to do with this measure for the Sunnyvale Library. But I'm, I'm yeah, sorry, just anyway. if I could just add, you know, each league, so leagues are, are cover different cities, and we cover Cupertino and Sunnyvale, which is why we're covering these measures. But Mountain View, San Jose, there are leagues that cover them. So if you type in LWV plus uh, Mountain View, you'll pull up that league and you go to their website on elections and they should have a form explaining the ballot measure or you could you can send an email to them and they can help you understand it. Same thing with those that live in San Jose. I see quite a few people that are from San Jose and other cities, LWV plus the city you live in and they can tell you more about your local measures. Okay, I know we're reaching um, yeah, not quite 8.30, but um, I'm thinking maybe about, we may go five, maybe 10 minutes over, um, but stick with us. We've got three more measures. Um, thanks for your time. So the next uh, measure on the ballot is uh, Measure F, and this is uh, amendments to the Sunnyvale City Charter, and it will require a majority vote. Measure F asks, shall the Sunnyvale City Charter be amended with three changes? To eliminate the voter registration citizen requirement for members of all boards and commissions to remove barriers to volunteering. Shall it change the required city council meeting frequency from two meetings per month to at least 24 meetings per year with no more than six weeks between meetings? And three, shall they replace gendered references throughout the charter with gender neutral language? So um, the city charter governs how the city operates and provides services to the community. It's kind of like the constitution for the city. Um, and our city charter or the Sunnyvale city charter currently has the following requirements. There are five boards and commissions that are called out in the charter. These are the planning commission, the personnel board, parks and recreation commission, the board of library trustees and the heritage preservation commission. These are referred to as charter commissions. The city charter 
also require or also calls out that the city council must meet at least two times each month. And the language in the charter uses gendered pronouns such as he and she, him and her. What measure F will do will amend the city charter with three changes. I'm gonna skip number one and then talk about two and three and come back to number one. So number two, it's gonna change the meeting requirement for city council to hold at least 24 meetings per year. So the same number of meetings as two meetings per month. And it will specify that there cannot be a gap between meetings of more than six weeks. It'll replace the gendered language with more ge with gender ne neutral language, such as they, them, one. And finally, it'll um, remove the requirement for citizenship and the age requirement that participants in boards and commissions be at least 18 years old. So the um, participants, uh, Sorry, commission members would still need to be citizens, I'm sorry, residents of Sunnyvale, but they would not be required to be citizens of the United States. What are the um, costs of the charter amendments? There are no specific financial costs for making these changes. Looking at the supporters and opponents, uh, the supporters include the Sunnyvale mayor, Sunnyvale city council members, uh, for a former mayor, and current members of the Sunnyvale School School Board and the Fremont Union High School uh, School Board, and top opponents include several current Sunnyvale residents. Looking what the supporters and opponents say, supporters say that the recommended changes better reflect our city's diverse and inclusive character. The changes apply to the five charter commissions, but they highlight that all other boards and commissions already allow non-citizen residents and youth to participate. The flexibility in the meeting schedule would make it easier to accommodate religious holidays, school breaks, and other conflicts. And the use of gender neutral language makes the city charter more inclusive without any legal impacts. The opponents highlight that the proposed citizenship amendment is not simple or minor. In addition to removing the requirement for citizenship, it removes the city's ability to guarantee Sunnyvale residency it removes the minimum age requirement, it does not establish a minimum residency requirement, and it doesn't provide a verification method to determine whether any applicant's responses or claimed principal address are factual. They also want to ensure that members of Sunnyvale's five charter boards and commissions be verified residents of legal voting age who act in the best interest of cities of the city and residents. With the local measures, we don't do, uh, the financial information is not as easily available, so we don't present that. Um, but we do, you know, as we said, we have presented who is in support and opposed to the measure. Uh, finally, in summary, a yes vote on Measure F means that the all the charter amendments would be made, and a no vote means that the Sunnyvale Charter would stay as it is without these three changes. Any questions? There are none. Okay. So next we turn to Measure Y, and Measure Y is a um, special tax for educational purposes for the Sunnyvale Elementary School District. In other words, this is a parcel tax for SESD, and parcel taxes do require a two-thirds majority to pass. Measure Y asks, shall the Sunnyvale School District extend, it, extend its existing $59 per parcel tax for eight more years? SESD serves about 5,600 students in eight elementary schools and two middle schools. In 2011, voters approved a parcel tax of $59 per parcel. And in 2016, they extended that tax for eight more years at the $59 level. The parcel tax provides a million dollars annually to support classrooms and instructional programs, and it includes senior exemptions and required accountability measures like a citizens oversight committee. Measure Y would extend the property, the $59 parcel tax for eight more years through 2033. So the tax would continue to provide the $1.1 million 
All funds raised would be spent locally and could not be spent on district administration. And it will continue the senior exemptions and accountability measures that are currently in place. Measure Y would cost $59 per parcel for eight years. And again, it would continue the senior exemptions and accountability measures that are currently in place. The supporters of Measure Y include the Sunnyvale Mayor, the former Superintendent of Sunnyvale Schools, and several community volunteers, uh, and which include former uh, school board members and the former mayor of uh, the city of Sunnyvale. And opponents include Mark Hinkle, president of the Silicon Valley Taxpayers Association, uh, John Dean, the chair of the Libertarian Party of Santa Clara County, and a Sunnyvale resident. What do supporters and opponents say? The supporters highlight that continuing this investment protects our award winning the award-winning schools keeps class size small as, as small as possible and helps attract and retain highly qualified staff and teachers. The parcel tax provides SE, SESD with a stable, reliable funding source that cannot be disrupted or taken away by the state. They highlight that quality schools protect and enhance property values and that the SESD parcel tax is the lowest among districts in Santa Clara County that have a parcel tax. Many other districts have parcel taxes that are closer to $100 per parcel, and they, Palo Alto has a parcel tax that's over $900 per parcel. As supporters also highlight that Measure Y will not increase taxes as if, um, as if uh, it's a continuation of the $59 per year that uh, is already in place. Opponents say that student academic performance for SESD does not justify this tax. Test results for 2023 show a decline in students' performance in English and math, and despite the drop in test scores, average teacher's salary has increased. They say that if you reward failure, you'll just get more failure. In summary, a yes vote on Measure Y means that a parcel tax of $59 will be assessed for eight more years from 2026 to 2033. And a no vote means that the parcel tax of $59 will expire in 2025. Any questions? There are none. Okay, we're heading into our last um, measure for the evening and this is Measure Z which is a school bond for the Cupertino School District. School bonds, local school bonds, require a 55% majority to pass. Measure Z asks, shall the Cupertino Union School District, or CUSD, authorize $347 million of bonds to replace leaky roofs, plumbing, and expand CUSD's science, technology, engineering, and math classrooms in, uh, in Cupertino, Los Altos, San Jose, Santa Clara, Saratoga, and Sunnyvale. CUSD serves over 13,500 students in 23 schools in the cities that I listed in the previous Scott, in this previous slide. There are 17 elementary schools, five middle schools, and one that goes from TK through eight. California law permits school districts to issue school bonds with the approval of 55% of the voters. So it's not a simple majority, it's not two thirds, it was, it's kind of in the middle at that 55%. School bonds can be used only for construction, reconstruction, rehabilitation, or replacement of school facilities. And in June, 2012, CUSD voters approved Measure H, which is a $220 million bond for facility repairs, upgrades, and new construction. Measure H assessed a tax of $21 per 100,000 of assessed property value. And those funds have now been exhausted. So all of the projects, um, you know, all that money has been allocated and the bonds have been fully repaid. What will Measure Z do? Measure Z will authorize the issuance and sale of up to $347 million in school bonds for critical reno renovations and improvements throughout the Cupertino Union School District. The project would focus on infrastructure repairs, energy efficiency improvements, upgrading campus safety and security, and enhanced instructional facilities, 
and for transitional kindergarten. The bond measure would require accountability measures, including a citizens oversight committee and annual financial and performance audits. What would measure Z cost? The estimated cost is $20.09 per $100,000 of assessed value. The final year in which the tax is anticipated to be collected is 2055-56, and the best estimate of the total debt service during the life of the bond, including principal and interest, is 647.7 million. Looking at the supporters, uh, you have uh, the state senator, uh, the Cupertino City Council, and various super, uh, council members from Cupertino, San Jose, and Sunnyvale, which are all cities that are served by Cupertino School District. The opponents include Mark Hinkle of the Silicon Valley Taxpayers, Taxpayers Association, John Dean, the chair of the Libertarian Party of Santa Clara, and William Might, who is a district resident. Looking at what supporters and opponents say, supporters say our schools are our community's most valuable asset and must remain our top priority. Measure Z will fund critical infrastructure repairs and it's a guaranteed local investment. Money, uh, the money must is raised locally and must be spent on local schools and it improves schools and classrooms with no increase in taxes. Opponents say, say no to endless bond debt and its resultant absorbent in taxes. In 2012, voters already approved a $220 million bond to fix leaky roofs. And endless rounds of bond sales will not help CUSD improve education, raise test scores, or reverse failing uh, enrollment. They propose that private alternatives can do a better job for our children at a lower average cost. In summary, a yes vote on Measure Z means that COSD can issue up to $347 million of general obligation bonds to fund school facilities projects, and a no vote means that COSD cannot issue these bonds. Are there questions? There is one, and I've been trying to find the answer. Um, the question is, has the prior Measure H been, and I think the implication here, been fully repaid? I think the, the uh, nature of this question, has H been paid off such that Z uh, doesn't add to the further debt burden, doesn't expand the net debt burden? And I think it's just about paid off. Pam, do you know? Yeah, so the um, it, it has been completely paid off. Um, so the uh, Citizens Oversight Committee, they have had their final meetings. It is completely Done. Yeah. So the the net effect on taxpayers will be neutral. Your the amount you're paying now is the amount you would continue to pay, not more. Um, it doesn't double up your property tax bill. It doesn't double right. on your bill. Right. And so if the measure is not approved, there would be a drop. But if the measure is approved, it would be say the same. Essentially flat. Yep. The other thing that happens with the bonds is that they sort of they start lower and they get a little bit higher because you don't issue all the bonds at once. You issue them in phases. And so at the beginning, you only have a little bit. And then over time, you kind of are paying off the ones that you issued early, paying off the new ones. And then over time, um, the amount goes down again because you've already paid off some of them. And so it tends to sort of bell curve in the, in the cycle, life cycle of the bond. And I think that was our last question. Yes. So um, this slide package doesn't have a close, so I don't know if one of you wants to sum us up. Sure. November 5th is election day. Be sure to vote between now and November 5th. And once again, this is being recorded. All of our forums are at lwvcs.org slash election dash forums. We encourage you to please take a look at it and please share the links with others. We're trying to get the word out. So we would greatly appreciate your help with getting the word out. Okay. Thank you very much for your time and attention tonight. And sorry, we went just a little bit over. Have a good night, everybody. Bye-bye.